Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Vantage Seminar. Today, we're continuing our series of talks on perspectives on Galois groups. And we're very happy to have Jesse Wolfson, who's going to be speaking on perspectives on Hilbert's 13th problem. Uh, Jesse, do we have your permission to record this talk? Yep. Oh, great. And uh, feel free to ask questions during the talk. All right, Jesse, go ahead. All right. Um Thanks so much to Rachel and Drew for um, inviting me. Um, I was really excited to see the theme of the Vantage Seminar uh, this fall uh, and to be kind of contributing to it. Um, I'm going to be talking about uh, uh, sort of work that has been going on um, that I've been sort of focused on for seven or eight years now. Um, much of that is joint with uh, Benson Favre and Mark Kisson. Uh, here you can see a photo of us in 2019. Um, I'll say this photo admits uh, many interpretations about what exactly we were making predictions about. Um, uh, and I'm also going to be reporting on some recent work with um, Alex Sutherland at Ohio State and Claudio Gomez Gonzalez at Carleton, um, uh, sort of building out our kind of understanding of these questions. All right. So uh, the basic uh, setup, and I'll just sort of start there, is you fix some ground field K. And classically, K is the complex numbers. But um, there's interesting arithmetic over, you know, in other characteristics. So um, uh, I'll sort of, you know, just have that standing. Um, and we want to kind of measure the complexity of algebraic objects. This is sort of a classical question, like how hard is it to solve a polynomial or how hard is it to uh, uh, represent some algebraic function? Um, and so this is a definition that um, in various forms goes back uh, to work of Kronecker in uh, the 1860s, um, uh, but really gets a, a burst of new life and becomes a kind of modern sub area uh, in the late 90s through work of Beale and Reichstein. And they say, if you're given a finite extension of K fields, then the essential dimension of that extension is the least D for which there exists um, uh, a field of transcendence degree D, K naught, um, some embedding of K naught into K, into the base extension, and a finite extension of K naught, which uh, after extending scalars gives you your original extension L, right? So in some sense, you're sort of looking at maybe after a kind of change of coordinates, what's really the transcendence degree of this uh, extension or what's the dimension, right? Okay. And uh, there's a very old theorem uh, that says that in characteristic not two, any quadratic extension has uh, essential dimension one. Uh, here's the proof. Um, and uh, of course, what's really going on here is the quadratic formula. Uh, and these are cuneiform tablets with the quadratic formula on them. All right. Um, uh, so that sort of, you know, essential dimension is looking at if you just have an extension, maybe after kind of changing uh, the coefficients using sort of uh, just arithmetic, how can you kind of simplify it? Um, but classically, when we're solving, we're trying to write a formula for a polynomial. We're not just saying let's use arithmetic to rewrite. We're introducing things like square roots or cube roots or other functions to write our formula down. And we might need more than one, right? So Cardano's formula for the cubic is a prime example. Um, and the way that this got finally formalized um, uh, in the 20th century said that if you, again, have a finite extension of K fields, then its resolvent degree is the least D for which there exists uh, some finite extension. Um, so you're embedding your field that you care about into some bigger field, possibly. And then you're filtering that bigger field by some tower of intermediate subfields. And you're asking that each intermediate subfield is built up, uh, it has a central dimension at most D, right? So in very classical language, you're saying, you know, a formula is a collection of algebraic functions composed with each other via arithmetic. And you're saying that no function can be a function of more than D variables, right? But you know, in the modern language, we just think of that as field extensions and we get this thing. All right. Um, and the classical language, which I like, is that uh, all these other fields, these auxiliary fields that we're using to build up our K prime that we then realize our field L in, those are called accessory rationalities, right? We have to maybe go outside our uh, starting extension L to build it. And so these are somehow kind of accessory. All right. Um, so again, there's an old theorem, uh, Cardano and uh, Tartali and Ferrari said that if you have an extension of degree at most four, then the resolvent degree is one because you can solve it in radicals and radicals are um, one variable functions, say by Coomer theory. Um, less well known, um, uh, there are theorems of bringing Klein, which say that uh, any quintic extension can be solved using only one variable functions and Klein sort of did this very beautifully 
using uh, the icosahedral function that he built. So these resolve into degrees are one. Um, and interestingly, like Kronecker kind of stumbled on the notion of essential dimension when he discovered that the essential dimension of the general quintic is two. So you really do need these accessory rationalities to solve it using only one variable things, right? That's sort of the, the history here. All right. Um, so uh, Hamilton had done investigations in this uh, as well, when Rowan Hamilton in the 1830s, um, and then Klein kind of brought in new methods uh, um, to try to extend Hamilton's work and ran up against the same kind of uh, bounds. Um, and, you know, the sort of first of their results said that um, any uh, sex extension, any degree six extension uh, has resolved in degree at most two, right? They wrote down a two variable formula solving the general sextic. Um, great. All right. Oh, Jesse, so, uh, Jesse, there's yeah. a question in the chat. Edgar, do you want to ask this question yourself or um, do you want me to ask it? Okay, uh, Edgar wanted to ask whether these include characteristic zero in these results. Yeah, yeah, all these things are characteristic zero, um, uh, like the classical results. But when you actually go through and like, what's the arithmetic that they're doing? You realize that it's it's you know uh, apart from a, a few specified bad characteristics, they just wrote down a general formula. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Yeah, and like I should say, like you know, speaking personally, like I'm really interested in the characteristic zero. One can prove that the characteristic zero. Uh, is kind of um, the maximal complexity. Um, that's uh, uh, recent theorems of Zenobi Reichstein actually, you know, sat down and, and did the comparison of, you know, characteristic zero to, to positive characteristic using very specialization arguments. So if you hope that, you know, there is some complexity lurking and the reason that we haven't found simpler solutions is because they might not exist, you would want to look in the characteristic zero case because um, that's sort of provably where they have to reside or where the most complicated ones have to resolve. Yeah, but of course, like, we're, you know, arithmeticians, many of us are number theorists, like, positive characteristic is fun, you should look there as well. All right, any other questions? Great, all right. So the, the essence of Hilbert's 13th problem, um, like the core problem uh, uh, where any progress on this, I think would be, you know, a landmark result, is just prove that this invariant, this resolvent degree is non-trivial. Find a single extension uh, of K fields for any K, for at least one K that provably has resolved in degree greater than one, right? And that's a completely open problem. Um, it's as open today as it was uh, in Hilbert's time. Um, and, you know, I'll be sort of giving perspectives uh, on what we can say about this problem uh, for the rest of the talk and sort of really hoping to kind of advertise it in this community in the hopes that, um, uh, as more people become aware of uh, the questions involved and the ways in which they might be appealing, maybe we'll get some progress. Um, and a related question, this is really maybe implicit in work of Hilbert and then explicitly called attention to um, by Segre, is not just prove that this is a non-trivial invariant, but it'd be like very confusing if like you couldn't solve everything in one variable functions, but maybe you could solve everything in like a billion variable functions, right? Like that would seem very strange. And so the expectation uh, is that uh, if you fix some complexity measure, some n, there exists some extension of resolvent degree greater than n for all n. Right. Okay. Um, and so the, the sort of theme of this talk is like, what kind of problem is this? Um, and uh, I'll be giving kind of various perspectives. I'll also just sort of say uh, in this crowd, the history of this problem sociologically is really, you know, I think interesting and perplexing. Um, we're, you know, in a present moment, and, you know, my, my co authors and I have been doing a lot of uh, effort on this to try to spread awareness about the problem, bring attention to bear on it, get activity, uh, and hope that that will lead to progress on it. Um, but if you go back, you can sort of see that essentially there are these 50 year gaps in the history of the problem. So before we started working on it, like the, the last sort of real focus on this problem per se, I would date to like the 70s. Um, and that's with work of Arnold and Brower, uh, sorry, Arnold and Shimura and Brower. And then you have to go back like another 50 years to the 20s. And that's like um, in the Göttingen school with like Klein and Hilbert uh, and their uh, contemporaries. And then, you know, you can sort of trace it back through Klein and then there's a gap. And then you sort of go back to Hamilton in the 1830s and okay. And then you sort of, you know, uh, sort of continue. But we've had this sort of history of like a few people work on it. They don't solve the problem. Uh, it, it dies for 50 years. Uh, somebody else kind of stumbles on it, realizes it's still open, finds it appealing, works on it a little bit, it dies for 50 years. Um, my hope in, in giving this talk and in the work we've been doing for the last 
you know, a uh, number of years to try to like break this cycle and have this be something that like the mathematical community in a larger scale kind of can attend to. And so part of sort of advertising is like, what kind of problem is this, right? What kind of mathematics seems to uh, come to bear on it? And how do we sort of hear it uh, uh, in interesting ways? All right. And the kind of um, uh, paradigm or, or emblem for my talk, this is a, a graphic from um, one of the last papers that um, Vladimir Arnold wrote. Um, and he sort of said, well, math is like a mushroom. And in this analogy, uh, you know, the theorems are the kind of these, you know, theorems are like the actual mushroom caps, like the fruiting bodies, which we find as humans above the soil. But most of the organism extends beyond the soil and is not sort of just the, the sport, the sort of, you know, the mushroom caps that sort of periodically get put up. And sort of Arnold traced that the sort of deep structure of the mycelium or what have you, you know, in his telling were sort of problems, conjectures, mistakes, and ideas. And I'll say that, you know, he was saying this in the context of describing his work on Hubbard's 13th problem. Um, but I would say that, like, you know, there seems to be an organism deep down there. We have very few theorems uh, at present. We're sort of still trying to map where the filaments go and what they sort of connect to. Hopefully, um, there'll be more that kind of uh, comes forth uh, as time goes on. All right, so um, I'm gonna give about five perspectives on this problem. Uh, and the first one is of course Galois theory, you know, fitting with the, the talk, uh, the theme of this seminar. Um, and so uh, to set this up, uh, one way that you can kind of rephrase um, uh, this problem is you say, take some finely generated K field, capital K, pick an, al an algebraic closure, and then you can build a resolvent filtration, uh, filtering K inside its algebraic closure. And at each stage, the field, you know, K superscript I is the thing that you get by adding on all extensions of resolvent degree at most I, right? So you can get a kind of nice closure operation. This is a perspective that Arnold and Shimura took up in the 70s. Um, and this filtration has some like reasonably nice properties. So um, one, you know, an extension factors through some KI, if and only if the resolvent degree is less than equal to I, this is like a you know, a sort of deepening of the solvable closure or things like that. It's like the resolvent degree at most I closure. Um, these extensions are Galois for all I. Um, any map of K fields that extends to a map of the fixed algebraic closures respects the filtration. So in particular, like the automorphisms of big K over little K respect this filtration. It's something like a characteristic filtration. Um, K I is solvably closed for I uh, at least one. Um, so in particular, these are perfect fields. They have sort of um, nice properties there. Um, and uh, we can be very explicit about what K naught is. Um, it's just given by um, extending the ground field uh, to its algebraic closure. So you sort of aren't, you're sort of insensitive for resolvent degree to kind of the arithmetic of little K. And you're really focused on kind of um, the arithmetic of the function fields here. All right. Um, yeah. And by the Galois correspondence, we can, you know, uh, rephrase that as a filtration of the absolute Galois group. Um, and uh, this filtration is, is by normal subgroups. Uh, uh, it's reasonable to ask, is this filtration characteristic? Um, uh, and uh, you can also just sort of, you know, now rephrase Hilbert's 13th problem as saying that the result increase greater than one if you can find any field such that the first piece of this filtration is non trivial Right, so that's kind of the Galois theoretic perspective on this problem. All right, so I don't have anything to say on that problem right now. That problem is still open. But if you squint at it and you say, okay, we're now setting something up on a filtration of Galois groups. Well, a Galois group is an atoll fundamental group of the scheme spec of the field. Now you can play a game or set up a, a notion for an arbitrary scheme. So I'll fix some K scheme X. Uh, its dimension is going to be D. Uh, I'll fix a geometric point so I can talk about its fundamental group. And the exact same idea allows you to find a resolvent filtration on the atoll pi one. Um, and uh, these will be by normal subgroups. And again, uh, this endows um, the atoll fundamental group is actually, it's a functor into the category of filter groups. All maps of case schemes will respect this filtration uh, in the following way. Um, and now you can actually begin to prove some theorems about this kind of um, uh, resolvent filtration on a tall pi one. So here's a kind of uh, a prototypical theorem um, following from work uh, with Farb and Kisson. And if we um, uh, let uh, sort of AGN be the fine modulized space of, uh, well, I'll say complex principally polarized field varieties and fix a geometric point, um, then uh, the sort of deepest part of this filtration is non-trivial. 
right? Great. Um, and uh, so this is sort of like a highly non-trivial filtration on the Tophelnode group of um, uh, the modularized space, you know, on, on the um, uh, sort of integral symplectic group. Um, and the basic idea is that we're going to sort of use the integral geometry of the whole scheme to kind of get our handle on this. Um, and so you can sort of reduce to showing that what you really need to consider is just some it's tall cover of um, the moduli space uh, with a monodromy of um, the moduli of billion varieties with the um, principal P level structure stays unchanged if you restrict it to that cover. Um, and then on that cover, you need to show that you can't compress the, um, the level P cover onto a cover of a smaller dimensional variety, right? So that's all this data about there's no regular map F from E to Z where Z has lower dimension, such that there's some tall thing on Z that pulls back uh, uh, to give you uh, the level P cover, right? So this is a sort of pretty straightforward reduction here. Um, and then the- Can I ask yeah. a question about this? Is this, is this connected to questions about um, elatic monodromy groups of the moduli space of abelian varieties, or is that a completely different direction? Uh, elatic monodromy groups. Um, you mean like uh, in a kind of like a uh, uh, piatic Hodge theory kind of notion? Sort of like the action of the fundamental group on the, the L torsion of the abelian varieties? Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's exactly what's going on, right? I mean, here my P is L and I'm going to be using things about characteristic P to kind of give this argument, but it, it, it's absolutely that. We're going to, we're going to say that the, the, um, uh, uh, you know, sort of finite cover given by, uh, if you wish, a, um, uh, associated P torsion point uh, over every um, abelian variety or the fiber is the set of all P torsion points over the abelian variety, like that monotromy is going to be incompressible. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's, I mean, that's what's going on with this like AG comma PN. That's the cover in question that we're going to use to detect this non-triviality. Mm -hmm. Oh, thanks. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and so now that we're, you know, the sort of deep fact that we're going to use here is that the congruent subgroup property actually gives us a lot of control over what these arbitrary tall covers E that we have to consider will look like, right? So the fact that pi one of E surjects onto the finite symplectic group combines with the congruent subgroup property to guarantee that E is dominated by uh, a principal L cover, you know, the level L cover for some L prime to P. And then um, uh, you can use a sort of very classical piatic Hodge theory um, to show that if you restrict the level P cover to this auxiliary level L cover, it's incompressible, right? So that's how we sort of, you know, uh, uh, get our obstruction. Um, and so we see that, okay, you know, using some geometry, this filtration on, um, on the symplectic group, on, on this at all pi one is highly non -trivial. All right. And so from this perspective, like the core challenge is birational, right? Like we've been trying uh, uh, to say, how can we make this argument work not for, uh, the full moduli space, but for some Zariski open. Um, and of course, you know, uh, from the perspective of um, uh, fundamental groups or in this crowd, I would say that, you know, you hear by rationals, the issues about ramification, right? The difference between the uh, the fundamental group of a, you know, dense Zariski open in some normal scheme and the fundamental group of the whole thing is about ramification, uh, plain and simple. Um, but you might say, okay, like, let's try to sort of, you know, study that purely by a rational problem. Um, you can say, okay, well, you know, resolving degree minimizes over these accessory rationalities as well as being by rational. Uh, let's disallow the accessory rationalities, but keep the value rational transformations. And this puts us back in the framework of essential dimension due to Buell and Reichstein. And here I'm just giving a geometric version of it. This is exactly the geometric counterpart of the definition I began with. Um, and then once you have this definition, there are a lot of techniques lots and lots of techniques for um, putting lower bounds on essential dimension. And in particular, you can show that for every N, the essential dimension analog of this like Hilbert Sager problem holds. Um, and so somehow what you kind of really conclude is that the challenge is somehow the interaction of birationality and these accessory rationalities. Somehow like the interplay of any two of these at once is really hard. We have methods that allow us to handle one at a time, right? Either we can say, everything has to be regular and then we can have towers of covers or we can't have any towers of covers but we're allowed to work by rationally 
And then sort of this central challenge right now is like how to get them both to talk to each other uh, at the same time. All right, um, any questions? Great. Um, uh, when, um, back in the theorem that you had before, that G choose two uh, or the G plus one choose two, that's just the dimension of the moduli. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And is, yeah. do you think that's exactly the right number to put there or? Um... Oh, no, I mean, you can show that other parts of the filtration are also non-trivial. I mean, I haven't, I would love to understand the fine structure of like, what's the, you know, well, what can we say about each stage of the filtration, right? Um, and you can use a lot of uh, interesting geometry to start saying that. So, you know, you have um, results like Gromov chain, uh, which say that if you have like a rank two locally symmetric variety, then there's no um, uh, holomorphic map to a higher genus curve. And then you can rule out the low genus things using things like Matsumura vanishing. And that would show that the first piece of the filtration is non-trivial. And, you know, um, uh, I'd be, I think very little is known about this. Um, uh, I think there's a lot of really interesting stuff here. Um, uh, I would say like, you know, uh, this is stuff that I, I'm trying to write up, the pandemic slowed it. You know, a lot of these were, were arguments that Mark and Benson and I came up with as kind of heuristics to try to solve COVID-13. We haven't done that because it's, you know, pretty hard, or at least we're not able to do it. Um, at a certain point, you're like, well, maybe the heuristics might be kind of adjacent results and we could sort of write those up and somebody else could sort of carry on the torch or what have you. But I'd say like this whole filtration, I would love to know more about it. I'll, I'll ask more questions. There's a lot of ideas from geometry and arithmetic you can bring in. I'd love to know more. Oh, thanks. There's some other questions in the chat and um, maybe I'll just um, read them. So, so sure. uh, Sam Schiavone asks, um, is anything known about at what stage the filtered pieces become trivial? And then Edgar added, or what else we know about the filtration? Yeah, right. Uh, so, you know, I can show in certain examples that the filtration doesn't become trivial until it, it absolutely has to, right? That's what this theorem is about. I, probably actually, I'm looking at this theorem now and, and I'm realizing there's a minus one that I should have said. So this would be one less than the dimension we're saying is non-trivial. Uh, that's uh, just a typo in the thing. But that's like, basically the, the if you go back just from the definition, the if D is the dimension of the variety, then your filtration taps out just the way, you know, everything is built by, every finite extension comes from a finite extension of the variety itself. So there's nothing further you can do, right? That's where the maximum. So this is a typo here. This should have said minus one. I'll fix that um, in email to Drew and Rachel. So that's like really, the filtration stays non-trivial as long as it can in this case. Um, we're using pretty special things about the moduli of billion varieties to show that. You know, uh, I would imagine that you can come up with lots of examples uh, of different behavior. All right. Okay, so just in the interest of time, I'll keep going, but keep coming. The questions are great. Thank you for asking them. And, I'll sort of pause a little bit later. So sort of the summarizing, like the, the challenge is somehow like getting the birational problem and the accessory rationalities both in play and what are techniques that can survive both of those. Um, and as a kind of, you know, intermediate problem, um, uh, you can ask like, is there a local ring such that this filtration is non-trivial on is it all pi one? Um, and I guess if I had to guess right now, I think yes, but I haven't managed to write a proof of that. And I think this is like a nice question, right? Hilbert's problem is like, does there exist a field where this filtration is non-trivial, you know, does there exist a local ring? I think is a is a pretty good uh, 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 intermediate problem, and it would be quite interesting to know the answer here. I mean, if you prove it no, you've solved Hilbert's problem. If you prove it yes, you know, maybe you've invented some new techniques that, that get us closer. All right. So that's my first perspective as Galois theory, and we you know didn't manage to solve the problem, so let's change our point of view and see what we can keep saying. Um, so there's a different perspective, and this is really building on um, uh, the perspective that um, Reichstein and Bueller, uh, uh, Bueller and Reichstein, you know, Jones and Obi um, uh, introduced. And that said, well, let's try to hear this as a problem about group theory. So um, you can define uh, an invariant of a finite group um, by just saying, uh, let's define the resolvent degree of the group to be the supremum of the resolvent degrees of all Galois G extensions. And you might worry this is infinite, but uh, this will in fact be a finite number. Um, uh, in particular, uh, it has some nice properties. The bottom one guarantees that it's finite. It's at most the dimension of any uh, faithful linear representation um, of the group. Um, uh, 
And, you know, it also sort of just plays well with the group theory, right? So uh, this really boils down to a problem about the resolving tree of finite simple groups using property two. Um, and there's a bunch of things that are known. These classical results go back quite some ways. So um, uh, we know that the resolvent degree of all the cyclic groups are one, it's Coomer theory. Um, work of Klein shows that uh, the resolvent degree of A5 and PSL2F7 is one. That's his lectures on the acosahedron for the first one and the discovery of the Klein cortic for um, uh, PSL2F7. Um, Hamilton's work on A6 shows that the resolvent degree is most two. Um, uh, you can take work of Klein uh, um, and beef it up to show uh, that, you know, the next uh, smallest finite symbol group has resolvent degree at most two. Uh, Klein did work, Klein and Hamilton did work on the general degree seven and on the um, symmetries of the lines on a cubic surface. Um, and you can sort of keep kind of populating this list. So I'm, I'm you know, giving results. The result on WB8 is a recent result of Reichstein. Um, A9 and A8 are rules of Hilbert. Um, uh, uh, Claudio Gomez Gonzalez, Alex Sutherland, and I um, sort of tried to extend these to just get bounds for all the sporadic groups in a recent preprint. Um, and you can also show, and Hamilton was the first one to show this, that in the limit, the difference between the degree of the polynomial and its resolvent degree can get arbitrarily big. Oh, sorry. Uh, equals infinity, not less than infinity. Sorry. Um, uh, that's a typo there, I'll, I'll fix. So this should say that the limit of n minus resolvent degree of, of an goes to infinity. Well, and we have another question from Edgar here. Maybe you're about yep. to answer it. Do you know an example where you know the value and it's not one? No, 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 that's equivalent to Hilbert's problem. That's equivalent to Hilbert's problem. I mean, as far as I'm concerned, right? You give me a single group and, and you show its resolvent degree greater than one, and that's the core of Hilbert's problem, right? I mean, Hilbert's actual conjecture in the 13th problem, you go and read it, is that the resolvent, I mean, I'm giving it in the present language, but it boils down to saying that the resolvent degree of A7 should be three. But he returned to this in a, this beautiful paper he wrote um, towards the end of his life, um, where uh, he revisited these conjectures, explicit conjectures that the resolvent degree, that the general sextic needs a two-variable formula, so the resolvent degree of A6 should be two that the resolvent degree of uh, uh, A8 should be four. And then he uses this like beautiful argument where he uses the lines on a, the 27 lines on a cubic surface to write a four variable formula solving the general degree nine. So that puts an upper bound of four on um, the resolvent degree of A9 and he conjectures or his octic conjecture also implies that that's sharp, right? So these are the sort of actual problem, but if you sort of step back and say, okay, like really what's the core mathematical problem? What's the essence of it? It's find a single group such that the resolvent degree is greater than one, any single group, right? All right and, we, and again, wide open, right? So when you face a problem and you've like banged your head on it for a long time, you haven't made any progress, like one idea of what you could do is try to expand the context. So uh, uh, a perspective, which was sort of pioneered by Mercuriov in the central dimension uh, context is to just say, let's just define it for any arbitrary functor from fields to set. And that will then kind of specialize to the classical notions. Um, and so what you do is you say, okay, pick some functor. Uh, first, you define the essential dimension of an, of an element of the functor. And you just say it's the, the least D such that the element is in the image of something defined for a field of transcends to degree of most D, right? Um, and then uh, you have to sort of squint at it for a bit, but you then sort of uh, get this notion of the resolvent degree where you now allow yourself to extend your field um, so in the first one, L, you know, is a subfield, but here in the second one, L is some extension. And then you, you try to um, minimize the maximum of the resolvent degree of your extension and the essential dimension of the um, element extended along that extension. Okay, so this is what it is. It, it may look a little funky at first, but it's, it's sort of what the classical literature kind of gives us here. Um, and then you define the essential dimension of the functor as the supremum of the essential dimension of all elements and ditto for the resolvent degree. Great. Um, and so that's, you know, this is a very abstract looking definition, um, but you can sort of check it in examples. And so if you, if your functor just says, uh, give me this set of isomorphism classes of finite semi-simple commutative K algebras, uh, then uh, fields are such gadgets. And so um, uh, this recovers the resolvent degree of your field. And of course, if you know if you are in characteristic zero 
um, then you can just replace this by a tall, find a tall algebras up to isomorphism, uh, and you get the same thing. So this is sort of, you know, specialized, sort of just naturally extends the definition. Uh, if you have any algebraic group, you can uh, define the resolvent degree of G as the resolvent degree of the functor of isomorphism class of G torsors. And then you'll just observe that this uh, agrees with the above definition for finite groups, right? So this sort of allows you to have it for algebraic groups as well. Um, but you can also do this for arithmetic lattices. So um, if you have some arithmetic lattice, uh, you can uh, take a, you know, sort of cohomology of the profinite completion of that gadget. That will give you a nice functor, and you can ask for its resolvent degree. So here's sort of you know, a generalization that gives you to a wider class of groups. Um, and it turns out that in this wider class, you can actually start proving theorems. So a recent result of um, Reichstein's uh, showed that um, uh, for any connected algebraic group, the resolvent degree is unconditionally at most five. Um, uh, if it has no simple factors of type eight, it's identically one. Um, and then this is based off a of conjecture, this is you know, in the context of the conjecture of Tietz, uh, where Tietz conjectured that for any connected group, every G torsor over a solvably closed field splits, right? And that would imply, and type E8 is the only remaining case. And of course, this conjecture would imply that the resolvent degree of every connected group was identically one, right? So you can sort of, uh, this is in a paper that Zenovia just wrote called like Al Hilbert's 13th problem for algebraic groups. And the kind of point of the paper is to kind of maybe provide evidence that maybe uh, Hilbert's expectations are wrong. And we should think of, that this invariant really is one um, by, by some like set of solutions that we haven't discovered yet. All right. Um, a counterpoint to this, um, and this is sort of, again, one flavor of, of uh, the arguments that, you know, Benson and Mark and I have come up with. Um, but if you have a, reduct a reductive group over Q with Hermitian symmetric domain X, and you have a co-compact arithmetic group inside the real points. Um, then the resolvent degree of this arithmetic group is at least the dimension of the symmetric domain, right? Um, and there's a variety of different arguments you can use to show a result like this. Um, here I'm using co-compactness and we can just essentially boil this down to an argument with um, Verdinger's theorem. Um, uh, but you can use other aspects of geometry to get a handle on this. Um, and so, you know, these two theorems together pose a question. Uh, do you think a finite group is more like a connected algebraic group or an arithmetic class, right? And that sort of guides, you know, maybe your intuitions about how to think about uh, how you might think about Hilbert's 13 problem. Okay, so that's two of my five perspectives. I got three more and about 15 minutes left, but I, th I think I'll manage to, to hit it. So Arnold, who is really kind of the reason that Benson and Mark and I got into this and was just a very generous fountain of ideas, right? Arnold gets very famous at age 19 for claiming to solve Hilbert's 13 problem. And then starting around like age 28 uh, for the rest of his life, yeah, is basically writing more or less continuously about how he didn't touch the core problem and he's trying to generate ideas and he, he can't make the ideas fully work, but he still kind of wrote them down and shared them with the mathematical community. And so we can kind of try to, you know, pick them up and explore them. So uh, late in life, he, he summarizes some of his thinking in the 80s and says, perhaps there's some kind of a mixed Hodge structure whose weight filtration provides the information that would allow you to detect the resolvent degree, right? Maybe we can sort of use mixed Hodge theory to pick up the dimension of the accessory rationalities, right? Okay, and you sort of, you know, look at this and, you know, I think this is what got, um, uh, uh, well, that's actually what got all three of us really excited. Um, and uh, using classical Hodge theory, um, it's just theorem of the fixed part, you can say if you have a smooth complex variety and some integral variation of Hodge structure, then the dimension of the image of the period map gives a lower bound on its resolvent degree, All right? And here again, resolvent degree, of the functor, of the element of the functor, which sends uh, a field to isomorphism classes of variations of mixed Hodge structure over spec of that field. All right. Um, and in fact, and this may be the challenge, the theorem of the fixed part implies something much stronger, uh, which is that uh, you're allowed to uh, restrict along any finite, quasi finite map, and the resolvent degree will still be at least as big as the dimension of the image of the period map. So somehow quasi finite maps won't change this lower bound. Right. And you might hope to use Piatic Hodge theory, um, uh, either in classical in classical forms or in, in any of the sort of you know new forms that have come online in the last five years to try to adapt this argument to finite covers and again view something like the P torsion and abelian variety as some finite uh Hodge structure and try to use this there. Um and the problem is that the heuristic is just too strong, right? Um and what you can show is that for any finite group uh and any connected G cover. 
there exists a generically finite uh, uh, map E over the base, such that when you restrict the, um, such that the monitor only stays the same when you pull it back, so the cover stays connected when you pull it back, but the resolved degree is one, right? So this is sort of, if you, if you literally took the heuristic from classical Hodge theory and tried to apply it to finite covers, it's just too strong, it can't work. Um, and the best that, that um, we know how to do is to say, well, we can make this argument work if your auxiliary accessory, if your accessory cover is of degree prime to P. There we can make it work, but we can't handle things that um, uh, have a degree divisible by uh, the given prime. All right, so a, it's an open question. Um, is there a different Hodge theoretic approach? Um, I don't have any good ideas. I think we don't have any good ideas on this, but that is not a non-existence proof. It's just a, you know, uh, uh, there's not an obvious way to, to um, hear Arnold's kind of idea at the present that I'm aware of. All right, so um, let's move on to a different idea that Arnold had. And this is sort of, you know, this, this set of ideas launched a lot of work in topology. Um, you know, uh, as I'm sort of as trained as topologist, think of myself primarily that way. And if you mentioned Arnold, I would have said, oh yes, you know, um, uh, homological stability braid groups, you know, configuration spaces, hyperplane arrangements, you know, he did sort of really cool stuff uh, back in the 70s. And you go back and look at what the names of those papers were. And here's the first one, and it's called On Some Topological Invariance of Algebraic Functions. And Arnold is very explicit that he wants to try to use topology to try to um, tackle Hilbert's 13 problem. Um, and he set up this very compelling and beautiful dictionary where um, he said, well, let's try to think of an algebraic function as something like a vector bundle. And if we sort of follow that through, then the braid group would be like the general linear group. And configuration space would be like the classifying space, like the infinite cross monion. And the Schubert cells on the infinite cross monion would be like the Fox Norworth cells on the configuration space. And we'd have characteristic classes for both. And there's a lot of like legs to this analogy. It's a very sort of appealing analogy that people have run with. Um, and you'd ask like, can characteristic classes detect resolving to be greater than one? Um, and the answer is like, no. Um, for deep reasons. So uh, the norm residue isomorphism theorem uh, implies that the resolvent degree of mod p Galois cohomology is identically one. Um, and that is enough to show that characteristic classes in Galois cohomology definitely aren't going to touch it. Um, and explicitly what you're showing is that every mod p uh, cohomology class dies after pulling back along a p through cover, right? That's sort of um, Coomer theory plus uh, uh, generated by H1 implies that. And so you're like, huh, you know, P roots are definitely uh, one variable functions. This is not going to work. Um, and you might hope, and we did for some time, that maybe you could get around this by uh, working on a smooth projective model, like birational algebraic geometry typically does, and sort of grappling with blowups or whatever. Um, but uh, uh, this is a work in progress. But, you know, at this point, I'd say I can pretty com compellingly for myself sketch a construction where if you hand me any mod P class, I can give you an exp explicit um, uh, closed sub variety of the of X, and then uh, a P power branch cover along that sub variety, which will kill off that class, right? So there's, there's really no hope for characteristic classes in any framework that I'm aware of here. Um, and the sort of you know the conclusion is that they just can't obstruct enough accessory rationalities. All right, so. I've got through four perspectives so far. I've got about 10 minutes left and I'll sort of get back to the final perspective. And this is, um, uh, you know, we sort of I spent five or six years really grappling with Arnold's work and ideas. I learned a lot. There's a bunch of papers um, that came out of it, but the problem is still kind of standing potentially, uh, uh, you know, unscathed. Um, and you sort of go back a little further in time and you say, okay, and you get to this quote of Klein. This is from his lectures on the icosahedron. And he's saying, you know, we must fathom the nature and significance of the necessary accessory rationalities. All right. Um, and so you might hear that, uh, uh, you know, you sort of think about that for a while, you meditate on it. And, okay, first let's get a modern definition of what we mean by accessory rationalities. So here's a definition that um, I like, where uh, some class uh, of accessory rationality is any sub of finite semi-simple commutative algebras, uh, such that, uh, the field itself is always in the class. The class is closed under tensor products. Um, and it satisfies some kind of nice extension properties, right? So if I have a finite extension and I have a, you know, a finite algebra over L, and then 
viewed as an algebra over K, it's in the class, then it has to be over L. Uh, and similarly, um, uh, uh, L has to be in the class as well, right? So these are sort of the things that are handed to you by a notion of like um, uh, solvable and radicals or things like that. Um, and uh, with these notions, you get a nice notion of like the closure, a closure operator. So you can talk about like the closure of a field K with respect to some class of accessory rationalities. Um, and you can specialize this to get uh, usual examples. So, you know, the set of all abelian um, uh, uh, field extensions uh, is a class of accessory rationalities or abelian, you know, finite semi-simple commutative K algebras. Um, and this gives you usual abelian closure. Uh, solvable uh, uh, algebras give you a you know, satisfies definition. You get your usual solvable closure. But also you can sort of say, well, let me look at all algebras of resolvent degree at most some fixed D of isomorphism. And now you get the various fields in the resolvent filtration, right? So you sort of introduced a perspective and now you can sort of describe things in a uniform way. Um, and uh, you can now relate this to this question of having enough points over uh, uh, these closures, right? So. Uh, a faithful G variety X, G here is any smooth algebraic group. Um, I'll define it uh, for the present talk as saying that it's versatile with respect to E. If for any G torsor T over respect K, the twisted form of X, inside the twisted form of X, the, the uh, sort of E points are dense in, right? Um, and with this definition, um, uh, Claudio and Alex and I uh, proved that this allows you to kind of reformulate the resolvent degree of the group in terms of uh, versality, in terms of these sort of E points. And we're sort of using the term special points uh, as a catch-all for a billion points or solvable points or rational points or you know, bounded RD points, you know, what have you. Um, and uh, you can now kind of from this perspective, you know, rephrase um, Hilbert's sextic conjecture, for example, arithmetically, um, and not just about kind of all uh, uh, a6 torsors, but actually about a very special one. So you can look at a single A torsor, A6 torsor associated to the Valentiner action of the alternating group on the projective plane. And the conjecture boils down to saying that for any faithful action of the alternating group on any smooth irreducible curve, then the, that, the twisted form of that curve uh, has no points over this field uh, given by the RD1 closure, right? And just as a, as a, you know, something that, that's implied by this, you'd ask, like, can you show that for every such curve, this twisted form has no solvable points, right? That would be, I think, major progress towards um, uh, the problem. Uh, and of course, the challenge with this, um, this is a challenge that, you know, um, Poonin articulates compellingly um, in his book, his beautiful book on rational points on algebraic varieties, is, you know, we need better obstructions, right? How do we obstruct solvable points on a given variety? Um, you know, because of Teat's conjecture, for instance, like brower monitor obstructions are trivial if you don't have any, um, uh, uh, if your Brouwer group is trivial and the Brouwer group of any solvably closed field is trivial, right? Um, so, uh, you know, I'd say we have very few ways of obstructing solvable points that I'm aware of. Um, there's some work by Powell um, from about 15, 20 years ago. Um, uh, and there's a, you know, some work by Woolley, but there's, it's not really something where you can pick up tools off the shelf and with confidence kind of apply them. And I'll just sort of, you know, advertise this as like, I would love more tools. So people in this audience know tools or if anybody's seeing this video, you know, afterwards has tools they like, please email me. Um, uh, I think that, you know, being able to sort of make headway on obstructing solvable points uh, would be, you know, genuinely interesting in a way of kind of approaching this problem. All right. Um, so I guess actually that's, I'll, I'll pause. Are there any questions on anything I've said? That looks great. Awesome. All right. Um, well, I'm going to end a little bit early, um, but I'll just close by saying, you know, again, uh, one way of thinking about uh, these different perspectives uh, is to go back to Arnold's idea of the mathematical mushroom. And we're somehow wandering kind of, you know, sub subsurface here, following filaments, trying to figure out where the organism is hoping that there's a, you know, a fruiting body that's going to pop above the soil in the form of a theorem in some way. That's perhaps an optimistic take. Um, and uh, uh, another take uh, I might offer uh, is this uh, image here of um, the monkey god in the hand of the Buddha. Um, uh, 
and I'll just sort of say either you know this um, this uh, sort of anecdote um, uh, or you can look it up online. Uh, but in this kind of parable, I would say, uh, you know, we certainly, you know, me, Mark and Benson, uh, maybe the mathematical community are, you know, the monkey. And, you know, we sort of somehow for all of our efforts have not ever managed to leave the Buddha's hand here. Um, thank you. Oh, thanks so much. Well, I, I have one question, but it's sort of technical. So I hope somebody else has <laughs> another question that can be asked first. I'll ask a non-technical question. So after your five different perspectives, what, what's your take on your answer to the question you asked at the beginning? What, what kind of problem is it? Man, um, uh, I don't know, right? I mean, it's a rich one. I mean, I think like what's appealing about this problem for me is just how much, how many different types of math come into it. Um, uh, I'm not convinced that the solution is gonna come from one of these five, I should say. There are a few others that are lying on the shelf, but that are like really underexplored. And, um, uh, you know, if I manage to kind of run myself fully aground on, say, you know, trying to study solvable points, which is, I think, the current one that has some legs, um, uh, then I'd have to turn to those. I mean, um, you might ask, like, what, what's the heuristic? You know, I mean, I've, I've, in this talk, I've given some heuristics about why you might think the answer might be that, yes, it is greater than one, coming from, say, arithmetic um, uh, groups or, you know, the Tolfanon group. Um, there's, there's classical work of the Strovsky from 1920 where Hilbert also asked this problem about analytic functions, did a sort of genericity argument saying that in general, the answer is non-trivial for analytic functions. And then Ostrowski wrote down like effective methods for showing that specific analytic functions had analytic resolving degree greater than one. Is there some bridge from analysis to algebra using some sort of rigid geometry that one can use? Maybe I've, you know, at several points thought the answer is yes. I don't know. We haven't tapped out all of Arnold's ideas. Arnold wanted to build a braid enrichment of Galois theory and think that maybe with braid Galois groups, you could touch this, you know? So it's just a very rich and mysterious problem, I guess is what I'd say. Great, let's see some other questions. Well, um, I was taking a look at your, your paper about um, about perspective two that you talked about. Yeah. Uh, looks like an amazing paper. And one, one question I had is that at some point you use this um, condition that you need to hit the ordinary locus in order to apply a certain theorem. Yeah. And uh, do you think that's really crucial or is it just that you need the P rank to be positive to get this off the ground? Yeah, so that's a really nice question, um, Rachel. So the 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 theorem, I'll just for the audience, the theorem that Rachel's referring to is we say that if you have, um, let's say, a smooth sub variety of um, uh, the modulus space abelian varieties that has a smooth integral model that hits the ordinary locus uh, uh, in characteristic P, then the dimension of that variety is a lower bound on the essential dimension of the the um, P torsion cover restricted to it. Um, I don't think that's probably necessary. I think that one could get different bounds with uh, other assumptions on um, uh, how the um, how the finite flight group scheme uh, behaves. Um, the paradigm that I sort of know, and I mean, I learned a lot of this from from Mark. So I'm not sure Mark agrees with me here. Um, is that uh, the ordinary locus is somehow some arithmetic analog of um, a geometric cusp of um, like in the boundary of the, the geometric moduli space. And specifically, it corresponds to the cusp indexed by a, um, a Siegel parabolic of the um, of the symplectic group. Um, but you can start doing group theoretic arguments with um, other parabolics, and you get actually similar um, uh, theorems purely geometrically. I think um, uh, Patrick Brosnan and um, uh, Fakrudin um, uh, wrote those down. And you could imagine that the arithmetic analog would hold for, you know, different conditions on the finite flat group scheme. Um, and so I think that that should probably hold, but then you need somebody to kind of work out kind of what the arithmetic monodromy in some, you know, piatic formal neighborhood of various of the, of the super singular loci were. And I just, I'm not aware that anyone has done that. I think it's an interesting problem, uh, and would love to sort of see something on it. Um, uh, 
there's also kind of related work by, I think, um, Fakhrud and Saini that's recent. But I, I, you know, looking at trying to use that kind of monodromy argument, uh, arithmetic monodromy to um, uh, grapple with these questions. Um, but I'm, I'm not aware that anyone's like done the work to do it. I think it'd be really nice. Oh, thanks. Let's see, any other questions? Wonderful. Well, let's thank Jesse again. <laughs> thanks, everyone. And our next talk is going to be next week, November 14th, by Jennifer Paulus. <laughs>